What's your name, where are you from, and why are you here today? My name's Alex, I'm from the East Bay, and I'm here because I'm coming home from work. Awesome, where do you work? I work at Archer Salon. Right on, so California native, California resident, you gotta have some stake in the big questions facing California right now. Should the state split up into three separate states? No, I don't think that would be a good idea. Why not? Um, well, the last proposition that I saw about it wanted to make the coast and the uh, inland areas separate. And while some of the people in the inland areas might think that would be a good idea, most of the economic driving is on the coast. If you separate them, they're going to starve. Wait, I thought all the food came from the inland area, though. Well, not little. <laughs> you know what I yeah, Economically, not necessarily in terms of food. Okay, but you would get three times as many senators. You understand that, right? You would have that much more power in Washington if you split up into three different states. You don't think that would be good for Californians overall? Nope. Not worth the trade-off? It's not worth the trade-off. Well, what are the benefits then of staying together as one state being one of the biggest states in the union as it is right now? Uh, I think it's useful. Well, I mean, it works for us, I guess, to some extent. But, I mean, how much can it work for us given that Given the Electoral College and the way that we, you know, uh, count how many electoral votes that we get and all that kind of stuff, so I don't know. I just don't really think chopping California up, like, that's going to be all that useful. All right, so what about the proposition for California to just leave the United States entirely and secede to be its own sovereign nation? Well, then we don't have the Electoral College problem, do we? You're not fighting Washington about anything anymore. No, and then we're also collecting the tax revenue, like... Hypothetically, we could t we could collect slightly less taxes and still have more overall revenue and then spend it in a way that's more consistent with how Californians feel we should spend our money. So do you think that's, that, that is indicative of a general principle about government, that the, the more localized it is, the more in line with the will of the people it is going to be, as opposed to we have power concentrated in Washington and people in Washington are making decisions for people all over the country that people are better off when decisions are localized. Well, there's a lot of different ways to think about that, but I suppose that makes sense, especially now in terms of globalization and just sheer size. Um, how we make our decisions is going to, we're going to have, we're going to be able to be more nimble and more responsible to our particular population than in a federal construct where a lot of these, especially with the way that we do it, a lot of these smaller states are kind of wagging the dog. So if California seceded and became its own sovereign nation, would you then support it, splitting up into three separate sovereign nations no. for all of those same reasons? <laughs> no. well, you, but you see how then you're, you, you have a big conflict here because all of those things that you just said about California being better off if separate because it's more nimble, it's more agile, it's more in line with the needs of the people who are its constituents, wouldn't that then be true for the coastal region and Northern California and the inland area? No. <laughs> That's a false choice. It's not true, man. It's not the same thing. California versus the inland areas is not the same thing as California versus the entire country. They're apples and oranges. They're not the same, and that's a, and that's a dishonest comparison. Well, no, because what I'm looking at is what is the underlying principle here, right? How localized should government be to be as much in line with people's needs as possible? Because there's two ends of the spectrum here, right, that we could have globalized government. That there's only one government <laughs> entity <laughs> on Earth, or that you could have... I love San Francisco. <laughs> or you could have government all the way localized down to the individual community level and have it customized as much as possible. So if there's if there's a medium point, what is the guidance for hitting that medium point? You take into account economies of scale. Um, what California can do as a larger state or as its own country is very powerful. Um, I would not, however, want to... So, like, any given state, could, state, save for some of the really small ones, um, could easily be its own country. And, in fact, I think back more towards when we first started assembling the Union, that's sort of more how we thought of it. Articles of Confederation versus the Constitution. As the exactly. As the, um, until, like, the, yeah, until the federal government became stronger and we gave up more power to it. Um, 
I think California or something half its size or somewhere anywhere in between there is a good sized country that has the economic power and ability and the land resources to be able to do a lot of things. I think if you chop it up too much, you hinder that. Well, what if you chop the United States, like let's say all the way down to the county level, hypothetically, right? There were no state level organizations, every county was independent and autonomous, would we somehow not be able to scale certain economic functions through corporations, through companies that are able to operate across county lines? Would we not still have economic power? Does having government... Those governments, you still have to get all those governments to agree in order to do something like a highway system or something large. If they, if you, when there's a point where you're so small, larger infrastructure things are not really feasible and you got too many chiefs and not enough uh, and too many chiefs trying to make decisions that are just not going to pan out so, because there's too many people with different opinions. So how did we get the internet as a global system with agreed upon protocols and interfaces that are standardized where people all over the world can talk in a way that was able to cross government lines? Why didn't we need a, a global government for that? And if that's the case that we we don't need a global government for that because the internet's doing pretty well without global governance that we could still have those economies of scale, we could still have that coordination, and we could have it better when it's not being controlled by a central authority, when it's decentralized and cooperative. Decentralization works for some things. It's not going to work for everything. The internet is about communication and about ma about spreading information and getting connected and do and and in some cases being organized, but only to a certain extent. The internet still isn't used to spend billions of dollars on. Okay, hold on. So I just want to get to the heart of this philosophically. Then, what functions of government require that? coercive kind of centralization that couldn't be handled better in a decentralized cooperative manner? Our large infrastructure projects, water like roads, like we can't, roads, we can't do that roads, better. Waterways, um, how we deal with water. How, well, look, how much better would all of those things be if we applied the principles of the internet rather than the principles of yeah, government? The internet is etheric. It's, it's, it, yes, it has a lot of power. Communication and, and words have a lot of power, absolutely. But it's still. And it's virtual. But it's virtual. The hardware it's is still very thing. real, and it's better of a network than any government road system, than any government infrastructure system. So I just hope that, that this thought exercise challenges. But, but it's not. But it's not big like that. It doesn't involve. It doesn't take into account as many people having to work towards something like that. Something like that. Yes, of course. You know, uh, more people work on the internet than roads. To more democratizing content or building something design. You know, that is strictly design like design and non-physical like that. Yeah, sure. But trying to trying to figure out what we're going to do with water and how we're going to get it and how we're going to get it where, where it needs to go. No, it's not the same thing as a server. It's not. <laughs> well, it's still better decentralized. And, and what we have as proof for this is the government's interference with the ability for individuals to collect rainwater off their roofs. And a lot of places, government makes this illegal because they want to keep you stuck on the government grid and keep you from innovating. So I know we've gotten like to a and totally different area with this. And I've seen some governments enact repressive laws in that. But about, I don't know, 50 or 60 percent of the time when someone claims it's illegal to collect rainwater from your roof, that's not true. It needs to be, it, they have regulations in place for how you do it. It's not the same need thing. government it's permission. Not, it's not the same thing as banning. Okay. And everyone calling it banning is dishonest. See, everybody comes from their different biases and they all want to color everything a certain way. And it, it just irritates me because it, we speak dishonestly to each other. Absolutely. But in, it is true that we do have actual, in some places, government making it impossible, illegal, or very difficult right, for an on. individual to innovate in how they get water and claim their natural right to what's fallen out of the sky on their own land, on their own property. And I, and I would just hope that, that just this idea of challenging to like, what is the appropriate scale of government geographically? What functions are necessary to be controlled by a central authority that is coercive would, would lead you to the same conclusion of, of, of decentralization that we really can apply it to everything. It is interesting, and I understand where you're coming from on it. Um, I think that over time, things can change. Where, where we need to put our time and our money, really, is getting money out of politics and making people more responsible to other people. It's, I'm all for that. Liberta I, you know, I understand the sort of libertarian point of view. I think it works well in some situations and less well in other situations. Um, 
Yeah. Well, hold on. Let me let me because since you since you raised the word libertarian and I happen to identify as a libertarian, I gotta give you. A, yeah, I know. I <laughs> this guy's clever. You got you gotta give me a chance to, to to respond to that because libertarianism, properly defined, is universal nonviolence. That that you as an individual own yourself, and it's therefore unethical for me or for government or anybody to violate your self ownership. And so when you say sometimes libertarianism is good, sometimes it's bad, what you're saying is sometimes nonviolence is good in solving problems, but sometimes we should really just use violence against peaceful people to get things done. <laughs> and I, I just, you know, not only ethically do I reject that, but from all of my observations of the world, nonviolent interactions are more conducive to human happiness than violent ones. And anytime you institute the coercion of government, because everything government does is backed up by the threat of force one way or another. Even the good stuff that it accomplishes will be done better through nonviolent solutions rather than violent solutions. Tell me what giant mon multinational monopolistic corporations are going to do better in a libertarian system where they're allowed to do get away with more. They're not because they're going to be opened up to competition. And, and the thing about corporatism is that it's a real tragedy of the government racket and that people have been convinced that corporations without government power would be evil, but it's the government power that enables that evil, that protects them from competition, that protects them from real market regulation, that protects them from somebody saying, hey, I'm going to do a better job of that, and you're going to go out of business. The only reason that we have corporatism as bad as we have it today is because the government and the banking system protects existing economic interests. Absolutely, they certainly do, and that and there are prop there are problems with extreme capitalism. There's problems with extreme socialism. They are not always one and the same thing. I mean, like well, that is define a, capitalism, or and well, I mean, I guess what we would have here is extreme crony capitalism. Thank you, because because capitalism properly defined is just an economic system based on ownership of the means of production. And the big confusion about that term has come from people trying to make you think that the means of production are factories and, and tools and machinery when the ultimate means of production is Money. you. No, Money. no, Money. no, it's you, the individual human being. See, that's the problem is that we've come to think of capitalism as having to do with money more than having to do with value and ownership. And ownership means you own yourself. And the value that's created is not measured in dollars or widgets, but in, in happiness and satisfaction. And only with universal nonviolence, when your will as an individual is absolutely respected and nobody's going to put a gun to your head and say, well, you can't do that with your money, you can't do that with your body, you can't put those drugs in your body, you can't you know, decide what you're going to do on your own property, how you're going to develop your own business, then you don't have that freedom. And if, if you don't have that freedom, then you don't have true capitalism. What do you, wanna, what do, you do when a large corporation is you know, having poor manufacturing practices that are screwing up the environment or poisoning people or, you know, and so on and so forth. So if people are going to support that, if the market is going to say and we don't want... tell me the market is going to take care of it by not buying those things. That doesn't work. No, it's, it's hold on, because it's, it's a combination of, the, of these forces. You, you know, can't that just... Adam, right. That Adam Smith shit is a lie. <laughs> well, t to a certain extent, but here's the thing. A, a peaceful solution is always going to be better than a violent solution. That doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. So if the market is supporting pollution, you're going to get pollution. And the answer to changing it is to change the market, to improve the, the, the consumer consciousness in the market. market. But if, if you have government in place, it means that whatever Whatever that market accountability is going to be delayed, denied, and corporations are going to be protected from it. So if you have a polluting corporation, like we do, let's take the oil and gas industry for example, right? You have this great horrible oligopoly in oil and gas where all the major oil companies are in bed with government and they are heavily regulated in order to keep out competition. So if you wanted to start a company that says, hey, I'm going to start you know, doing the oil and gas thing, but I'm going to do it in an environmentally friendly way, they're not even going to let you compete. So the market is always going to demand better than what government is offering or, or corporatism is offering. So it's not that, hey, if we get rid of government, there's not going to be any pollution all of a sudden, but we're going to have actual means of competing with polluting companies and putting them out of business, whereas with government, we entrench them. Like I said, there's good and bad ways. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I appreciate liberty, you know, I, I 
appreciate the libertarian point of view because I think that those are the people you want to get on your side when you want to <laughs> bust up unnecessary bureaucracy. Or, and there's a lot of that or, to go around. Yeah, or overkill regulation or, or, or things like that. But at the same token, I do believe in social programs. I think that we should have universal health care. But there's ways to, there's better ways to do universal health care. And nonviolent, co non coercive, cooperative, community based ways. And I think, I hope you can get one you know, take away from this idea more than, than anything else that I want you to consider that regardless of what we want government to be, we can all agree that the more localized, the more decentralized power is going to be, the more it's going to be in line with people's needs. you agree with that? Yes, to some extent. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for your time today, brother. That was a lot of fun. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.